Okay then, series two, episode six. And hello, Laura Kerr. Hello. So let's get straight into this. I presume you've heard a lot of episodes of this anyway, so you know that the way I like to start is with uh, a bit of backstory. Uh, in, in this series, we're not talking so much about poetry. I think we will inevitably talk about poetry later on. But really, I'm interested in your career as an artist in, in the visual arts and every aspect of that, really. So I'll, I'll just let you talk and, you know, start wherever you want to start. Oh, OK. Um, visual artist, always been in Canada, uh, Manitoba, Winnipeg, Manitoba. And for some time, uh, a little while anyway, I was in Toronto as well, which is a bigger city. Um, I started teaching in Toronto and it was shortly after I had graduated from university and uh, I loved it. I was showing my artwork in, in a couple of small galleries and I was teaching classes in painting and drawing. And then I decided um, I was homesick for the prairies, for a smaller city, for a more affordable city. And my husband, um, Jeff, was an architect, a landscape architect in, working in Toronto. And he decided he'd start his own firm in Winnipeg and we would, that would be our one chance to me start a school. He would work as a landscape architect because we could afford it in Winnipeg and not so much in Toronto. So we ended up back home where we were born and um, I opened a school and he soon, who his, I should back up, uh, Jeff is also has an art degree, fine arts degree as well as architecture. And he started billing in and coming to the studio and started teaching. And the next thing you know, he started teaching graphic design and sculpture. And we both started teaching full time in the school. And now that's what we do. This is our school of almost 30 years. It's a long time. <laughs> it's a long, long time when, I mean, it's gone by very, very quickly. And um, neither one of us, um, you know, we're not close yet to wanting to retire from what we do and love, but uh, we teach all mediums and all ages, starting at age six, all the way to adult. And uh, at the same time as teaching, I have grown as an artist. And I think, and I've said this to other people before, um, teaching has been very valuable to me because I am teaching uh, high school kids and university age uh, students and young adults and they're always challenging me and we get great discussions so they've kept me young I've never I've never parked in one type of art you know I'm always moving and uh, I think I owe it to, to the fact that I'm surrounded by young uh, forward-thinking creative people yeah it makes sense that you would have a very well-rounded knowledge of art from having to teach lots of different people at different levels and yes. to hear their perspectives as well and to, to get so many different opinions on on what art is and what art can be I think I see that right. a, a lot in your work that the constant experimentation it must come from being around people who are at various stages and therefore them, themselves constantly experimenting right. to, to get to the next level well, well, exactly like I I have uh, to mentor people and um, other artists and um, I have to keep on top of everything so I am constantly researching in my own work I am constantly trying and experimenting with something new uh, reading about uh, various types of new media even that I can use in my work. And it's interesting because, um, you know, the new thing now would be crypto art. And that's, you know, huge now, NFTs. I haven't come across a great concern for it where we are, where I live, with the, the younger people here aren't as interested as they appear to be when you're looking on social media. When I'm looking at Twitter, it's just everywhere. It seems huge, right? But um, I'm teaching my university age people uh, here 
about NFTs instead of the other way around. <laughs> I'm the one that's saying, hey, why, why aren't you putting your digital work or your photography on open seas or, or whatever? And it's like, nah, I don't really know much about it. I'm like, ah. uh, you know, so here I am yeah. telling them what I thought they would be the ones to be able to tell me, you know, so it's interesting. Yeah, well, it shows how much you keep on top of things and how much you're, you're always looking out for new media and new ways of approaching art. I mean, let's yeah. talk about NFTs for a bit. It's, it's on my list okay. of questions anyway, because it is it is a divisive subject. There are lots of people who really don't like the idea of them for, for a variety of reasons. Uh, just looking at the, the artistic side for a moment before we get into other stuff, I've okay. seen some incredible, I've seen some incredible things in that mm -hmm. space and whether, whether it's visual poetry or, or visual art, it's a lot of it computer generated where you, we, yeah. you can, you can mint an NFT as you buy it and you don't know what you're getting and then a program creates it. And some of them are so skillful. There's so, there is yeah. some really, you can see some really innovative, amazing stuff there. You know, it's interesting too that um, when I look at some of the work, like when I look at a artwork in a gallery, I can't help but try and take it apart. In other words, how does it work? How did they make it? And I will look at whether or not the artist had, a, had underpainted something first before they put the other layers of paint over top all of these, type, you know, the medium that they chose to use, everything is, you know, you just kind of dissect the art a bit. And I I'm, I'm try to do that too with the NFTs that I see. And sometimes they're just so incredibly detailed and um, so engineered. And I guess it's coding, right? So I don't know a lot when it comes to uh, creative coding, but, um, I, I, I have tried to study it and it just wasn't, it wasn't for me. Uh, my brain just couldn't do it. But um, I, I know a lot of these artists are coding their work in uh, exceptionally probably complicated languages, computer languages. So they, you know, they've studied uh, computer language at university levels maybe, and sometimes maybe just on their own. But it's, it blows me away to look at what, what, these people are making and creating uh, numbers of them, not just one, but they're like little mini films. You know, those, the gifts that they do are like little uh, complicated animations. And, uh, and of course there's the photography too, and, or the still um, image, but it's just amazing. Really, and it, and it's like a whole frontier of of work, and yes, like anything, some of it is out of this world, great, amazing, and then there's the mediocre people, maybe still learning their craft, and then of course it can't all be great. Yeah, but well, people trying their luck, just posting anything they can, which, which is one of the problems, I guess. How how does one find the good stuff, right? Yeah, and there's there's just there's going to be more and more. It's it's only going to get busier and more cluttered. Yes, and you know what I see happening, which is interesting too, is I, I see there's more call to curate uh, the shows, like to put groups of people together and a theme where the um, work is almost like going into a gallery, and so you're seeing a group show online and some of it can even some of it uh, they they have aug the augmented reality where they've got you walking into a 3d space to view the work which you know is, is fascinating I, I i see sometimes that it's still it isn't there yet you don't it, you know sometimes i feel like technology uh, we will take on, artists are, are notorious for this, we will sometimes take on whatever there is quickly without really knowing how to use it yet. And yeah. some, of, some of that I see happening even with the NFT spaces where, you know, you've got a virtual space, but it's awkward, right? And it probably would have been better if they had just put it up on a, 
a web, like a wall, rather than the virtual space that you're walking through. But anyway, I mean, I, I mean, it's easy to criticize things. I mean, mostly though, I have to say, I'm, I'm impressed by a lot of it, um, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I have not put my work as a, I have not meant it. I haven't got got into that space properly because, well, there's a number of reasons. I suppose we can go into these reasons. I mean, for one thing, like I say, the most impressive stuff I've seen has been this intricate coded work. I can't do that. Right. I'm, I'm I'm useless at that. I can't code anything. So that rules right. me out there. Also, when when I see because a lot of it's uh, it's visual art and visual poetry, I don't see much with text. Right. And if I do, it's either asemic or it's something very minimalist. And again, mm -hmm. these aren't these aren't really things that I focus on in my practice. Right. Uh, so, what other reasons? I mean, what do you think about the idea of? Because I'm I'm a book person. You know, I like books. I like tangible objects. I'm fine right. with, with digital art. I love lots of digital art. But at the end of the day, I you know I make and sell books. I I like paper. I mean, how do you feel as somebody? Because I know that you make a lot of digital art. You also make analog art. How do you feel about that in relation to NFTs? I, I tell, well, a few things. I use Twitter to, because I like to experiment with different ways of making digital art. And when I put it on Twitter, I get, it's fast um, how people will sometimes will DM me things that they've noticed about my, that particular piece. I get a response that's quite quick. Overall though, um, I want to see, if I were displaying my digital work, I want to still see it in a, a gallery space. I'm not, I'm not there yet where I think the uh, NFT platforms can fulfill what a, a actual gallery space. And maybe that's because I'm older and I'm, you know, I'm a senior artist Maybe, maybe that's part of it, but I don't think so. I think that there's something I can, I experience standing in front of an artwork. I don't expect to experience on my computer. I don't think you can, at least I can't. So, I mean, that's one thought and probably one reason why I am minting in a way, I mean, I am putting my work on Twitter and it's there and not on a gallery wall. So, I mean, I'm not necessarily putting a price on it and I am letting people basically look at it, do whatever they want with it for free. But um, I still imagine my work as an installation. Uh, the experience that you might get walking into a space that was curated and uh, where the artist would work with the curator and the gallery owner to create uh, the impact that I would want it to have. So, but the book part is interesting because I thought, well, why aren't some of the publishers, especially like yourself, experimental, minting books, chop books, I mean, Right, hmm. but I don't. I still prefer to hold the book in my hands, as yeah. opposed to how much time would I spend. I mean, I do read books, PDFs on on my computer, and I appreciate anything that has been put out on a computer for free for people to look at. But I just loved your last anthology, not because I was in it. <laughs> But it was, um, I can't imagine what, it would not have done it justice, I don't think, to be uh, computerized. Mm. It's just a beautiful book and becomes like this object that you can hold, that you can pass around, that you can display, and that tactile, I still need. Yeah, I mean, well, we obviously we agree about this. And I think a lot of people 
think this way because 20 years ago all the, everyone was saying ebooks are going to ebook sales are going to dwarf paperback sales and hardback sales and it hasn't happened you know, no people still want i want to use the ebook like i do have books on my phone because i like that if i have an appointment and i have to wait in the waiting room for half an hour for an appointment i've got this book on my phone that i can read but that does not replace the value of books that's just a convenience thing for the odd time in my week or or months that i need to have read a book while i'm on the run so it's got a i, I can't say i don't use ebooks but it's definitely not replacing uh, in fact a lot of the ebooks that i have i also have in hard copy so yeah, and then the ebook is, as you say, just for convenience. Yeah. yeah. Any people when they go to, on a trip, so you can't lug 10 books in your suitcase. Mm. You can take all your books on your phone or one of those ebook things that you can get, um, Kindles. I mean, I think that's really the, the beauty of it. NFTs also are um, bypassing the rigmarole, the red tape, uh, everything that uh, people hate about galleries, having to try to find a way to put your art in an art gallery isn't easy. It is a hard process. So suddenly NFT, uh, crypto art, is allowing artists to skip that process bypass it completely and put their art in a virtual space with other artists so there's there's that advantage yeah so as we say you've said you're not going to do nfts uh no or at least not in the foreseeable future because never say never with these things well no um, I'll, exactly like what if what if uh something happens where there's a, a marketplace that is uh, has something different, a different quality to it. I can't imagine what that would be to, to make me want to use it. But I know there's going to be, you know, obviously these are going to evolve into something. They've really been around mostly like in a big way since COVID because let's face it, I mean, we've all gone online. And so the numbers grew vastly. And then people were discovering, hey, this is great. So we can put our art. And then at the same time, I guess you, there were a lot of uh, people outing uh, the, the galleries for, you know, discrimination and, 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 you know, all terrible things that, in other words, being too powerful and um, not necessarily being ethical in their selection and that kind of thing. So artists now can go and put their work, mint their work. And so yes, perhaps one day I'll just find a reason why I want to mint something and I'll do it. But right now I have no ambition to. The two main objections I hear about NFTs are environmental concerns. Mm -hmm. about the the yeah. energy used minting NFTs mm -hmm. and the ubiquity of scammers and con artists. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not too concerned about the latter because I think that's just something that's going to happen everywhere. I, I think in the early days of the internet, there were people saying, I'm never going to buy anything online. I'm never, I'm, I don't trust email because right. of course, scam, right. you know, scammers right. everywhere. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So I don't worry about that so much at all. Um, the, the environmental aspect, I think we have done away with that on some platforms in Remed. I, I'm not sure though. Um, I don't know how, you know, I actually haven't looked into that aspect. I wouldn't be able to say that that's some part of my decision is environmental factors at all. Um, I think I've read uh, 
some people saying it's uh, so min minute, but um, compared to other things, right? That yeah, well, impact. it's difficult. It's very difficult because there are so many different people saying different things. You don't know who to trust. Right. I mean, from, right. from what I've read, it, it does seem to be a big problem. Yeah. But also that there, there is cause for optimism that this is something right. that will be sorted out before long. But again, I don't know. I don't know if that's true because I don't know. I don't know which source to trust. I think from an artist's point of view, uh, a lot of the criticism I've heard or read is more to do with how it's presented. That um, it's not necessarily always presented as in having a curator uh, organizing it. In fact, I don't think there's a lot of NFT uh, crypto art shows that have been able to utilize a, a, I mean, curators do something that's majorly important in art when they bring a show together. They're, they're, they, they go to school, they study that particular field and they're good at it. So there's a bit of a, a, a carelessness in that aspect. I'm not saying that uh, that applies to everybody that's putting their art there, but uh, this is what I would probably be waiting for personally, myself. If there is a platform that's a little more what they call decentralized, right? Um, if I felt like I wasn't always having to be part of a, a, a club <laughs> or a you know what I mean? Mm. Um, I'm a I'm a loner. I, I I teach art. I talk about art. I don't have a friend who really isn't an artist. Even my children, to some extent, even though they're not artists, but as in visual artists, have, are in art fields. I mean, I'm surrounded by it always, but I work alone. Yeah. I mean, my husband's an artist. You know how many times we've collaborated? once <laughs> once and it was good it's not why we we had a good collaboration it was great but then we are very different artists so we we didn't repeat that but we do both work alone and you, and as an artist you go to school and you work alone you're seldom collaborating i feel like there's this uh, that i would be having to be obligated to be in a group and and i just don't know if that's true or it's just a feeling that I get but I want to be if I mint I'm just going to mint most likely on my own then if there's a curator that invites me to a show that might be different but I'm still on my own yeah well I'd like to know more about gallery work and and being right. a, being a curator which you you've done that well you know I had I I, I have had to be a curator to do with my student show exhibitions, my student shows, and I have curated some um, uh, professional art shows. It's not my forte. I know there are better curators out there who are, I'm not trained as a curator. Um, I, I think I do, did a decent, um, uh, put together a decent art show and, you know, the the placement of everything was to everybody's satisfaction and it had the right impact that we were looking for. But um, I mean, that's an expertise. And I have, there, there are a couple, I don't know the names, but I, lately I've been seeing, there's one uh, on Twitter actually, uh, uh, this woman who is a curator who has talked about how that is important and she hasn't seen a lot of that organization in the crypto art but maybe it's too new maybe that it's just a matter of time before that becomes regular you know well, i think i think there's probably a, i think there's probably a lot of naivety from most yeah. people about what a curator does i mean i wouldn't know and i think i would just guess oh you just pick things out and set them up and you know there's there's not there's clearly and a lot you, more to it than that. No, there, I, there I is a know. lot more to it. And I can't even say that I know everything. Um, I certainly, I think, I, I mean, obviously, I, 
I do know when a show's curator has been uh, so immensely valuable that the show is just uh, perfect in, in every way that it is laid out, the artist that work that was brought together or how they, their work was displayed. Um, you know, they're it, commonly, I don't think anybody really knows what a curator does because they're always behind the scenes. You know, it's like, what does a director do for a play? Mm. I mean, you know, we kind of get the gist of what a director does, but no, you have no idea the amount of things that the director is going to participate in, in every aspect of that performance. Yeah. Or right? what, what does a publisher do? Because when I started publishing, exactly I, yeah I, know, I had to learn doing it plus you know the other day i was thinking i actually it was when i was looking at the anthology um and i was thinking about your work and i was just imagining the amount of that we don't see the uh, work that we just take for granted mm. um on the other hand that might be a good thing in that you know we just we just see this beautiful piece of art <laughs> this book come to life and um we don't see the ripping you know pulling out hair or you know like this the, all of that we don't see that and maybe that's like a good director you don't see him screaming his face off or having a breakdown or anything like that but but he gets the job done um and it's a lot of work and a lot of yeah. Hours. But you know, you know, I've had a breakdown when I'm going on Twitter saying I'm, I'm sick of this anthology. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and it's funny because every time I read that, like when I have read you are saying that you're leaving, it, it's always that seems to be coordinating my same feelings. Like I'm thinking, I can't take this place anymore. I'm leaving. And then I read somebody like yourself or someone like that I that I follow say pretty much the same thing. And I think, yeah, we should all just leave, but we won't. I mean, what's the alternative? Yeah, Tw Twitter is good, isn't it? Let's, let's face it, it is good. It's overall, it's good. Let's say it's good. Let's say it's good. Um, haven't, you know, people have started to be upset about uh, the new owner. He, you know, we can hate him because he's a billionaire, but the man is not a, a stupid man. I should, I probably, you could, might not even want to put this on because I just said that, but I mean, he might do some wonderful things for Twitter. We don't know. I've lost a few friends already on Twitter because they, you know, don't want to be uh, on a platform that he owns. But any owners of these, right? The, the previous owner of Twitter versus the new owner, right? Mm. I don't know what. <laughs> They're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> Again, um, well, I, I, I think it's I think it's weird that people have already left Twitter because Elon Musk has bought it. I think at least wait so you can see what he's what he does it, because he might do something awful straight away. In, in which case, something terrible. Yeah. Like you know, I don't even think he should bother with that edit button. You know, people say I want to be able to edit, but here's the thing: we all know about there's some creepy people on social media, so they could write something to somebody that's really horrible and then edit it. <laughs> yeah. And then that person sees the first one and is, you know, wow. And then when they tell their friends, look what this person wrote, it's changed, you know, it's watered down or whatever. I just think it could be a, it's too powerful. Uh, just delete it and write it with the correct spelling you know, or whatever. Yeah, or put up with the wrong spelling. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, and just wait for that person to come along and say, you spelled such and such wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, there's always someone who's going to point it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, she can't spell. <laughs> See, an another way that you're really innovative is that you immediately want to try out the new tools that, that are available. I know you, you just started the community thing on Twitter. Yeah. I didn't know that existed until you started it. Oh, highly recommend it. You might enjoy it actually from a, I don't know who you'd put in it, um, from a publisher, uh, anagram, you name it. 
it's just a really nice way of sharing. Plus, um, the only people that can make those comments are the ones in the community. So hmm. I think of people can see and read them, but but um, it's kind of nice. And I am I did write to Twitter asking them to make it just slightly different from the regular Twitter feed by not having a limit on characters so that we could write as long as we wanted just in communities that's a good idea yes. yeah just in communities yeah. I think I, I like the limits in, in general yes. Yeah. yes and it would be because otherwise it's too same same right mm. um, what about what about Twitter spaces awesome you would love it I, I just have I, to say I did I, I sat in on one I didn't participate but I, I did I did listen it, in I think it's amazing I think it is the uh quick and simple idea of a podcast and you can record them and then you put them on your Twitter feed for people who couldn't make it to listen to um so it's the same idea as I I know many that I've sat in are I can't wait for the next one they're so they're informative you have a guest you talk to the guest speakers and then you open it up to questions it's it's great I think and it's only an hour I think they stopped in an hour if I'm correct they well they always seem to stop in an hour but uh yes it's a lovely way to interview people or to have a topic with guest speakers along with yourself and then an audience of participants who can ask questions so yeah it's a good one yeah i think i'll have to try that. one mm -hmm. you know as, as a tool for for the press i think to prep book launches Every, all the book launches hmm. so we did to uh, you as you know we tried doing a, a live chat just using hashtags we've done yes. that a few times and it, with mixed results the early ones seemed to work and then i think we lost we had fewer people turning up each time so we stopped doing them yeah so how does that work you, you ch keep checking the hashtag for new comments i think i've participated yeah. in the past um you know the problem with that is and it, it is also something that maybe elon can fix don't you find that it's hard to follow dialogue on twitter mm. that things get muddled and and you know you miss replies yeah uh, especially it doesn't read in the necessarily the right order that kind of thing so oh yeah especially with hashtags it, it, it's a mess if you try to use yeah, hashtags. yeah and so you know you're trying to follow a great conversation but it's really hard whereas at least with spaces it's this little condensed um conversation really I mean, one one thing, as you know, one one thing we've been doing a lot lately is polls. Yes, I like that. I yeah. I always love polls. They're great, and people just love them. And it's always some happy. people love, some people don't love them. It's always happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, some people make the valid claim that with a lot of these things we're asking, they're not clear cut. Then it's not here. Here are three discrete options that you've actually got a, a continuum of. Of mm -hmm. different responses and doing a poll just makes it so oversimplified and i i accept that as a criticism well you know but some people just are too are always looking at the ways of criticizing um you know that's just how some people are put together that's how they are like i can i will bring up something um say even in uh, the communities and it's just sometimes you want to throw out an idea i'm not necessarily even saying this is my idea mm -hmm. or this is my belief this is just what can we talk about what do you think of this? exactly yeah you know and so and maybe it's my fault i don't word it properly and so people will um kind of feel like i'm why would you say that kind of idea um back at me and it's like well wait 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 we just I just want to talk about it. It, it you know like I 
I haven't said my point of view yet. I would say my point of view eventually too with you. But here's the topic. It's just a topic. Yeah. And it's it's concerning that some people will be angry just because you've asked a question. Yes. There's, there's yeah. surely nothing wrong with asking a question. You would think. But um, yeah, I mean, I, like I say, it's just how some people are wired. And I, I, I get that and take that with a grain of salt that we, you know, some people are heavily into being critical and that's part of their way of even doing art. They may, you know. <laughs> the latest poll we've done is the question was all art is political, agree, disagree, or dismiss the whole issue basically was the third option. Yeah. And I thought this would be controversial but it, it turns out it hasn't been and the the results which just finished the results are pretty much split evenly yes uh I, that surprised and, me you know, I, I thought that, I thought there'd be fights here but I've always thought like this is like a, a personal thing as an artist do you feel as an artist that your work is political yes I do I do feel like my work is political don't know how to separate that However, another artist is quite welcome to say, no, absolutely not. I want to have it separate. Now, whether or not their work is, because, you know, see, this is what you make an artwork and um, once it's out there, people's viewing it, so the people viewing it, they can put whatever meaning they want in it. Mm. It's no longer my meaning. So I find that is in itself. How can you say you aren't, your work is not political. You don't know what someone else is going to say they see in it. As you know, when you put a, a, a comment on Twitter, you don't intend it to be a, a negative thing or to lead to a negative discussion but someone else is going to bring in something of their own political beliefs or whatever. Yeah, and, uh, oh, absolutely. And, and, and so, in some of, the, some of the replies we had to this poll uh, speak to a similar idea that somebody yeah. was saying, well, lang if, if you, let's look at the literary arts, for example, the way that language is developed through creativity right. can then be utilized by a politician or an activist and they can make it political. Uh, also, just the idea of art existing within a community and, and communities can be built around works of art or styles of art. Well, that's sociological, so that is effectively political. So right. I see, I agree with that, that art can be used politically, whether it's intended to be political or not. True. I uh, certainly, but my answer to that poll would be that it, it's art is not inherently political. And I think that's because I think of how I remember back to when I was five or six years old, just uh, painting very badly or playing around with a Casio keyboard. I I was making things. I was I wanted to make things. I wasn't being apolitical because I was opting out of politics. I didn't know what politics were. Right. So I tend to think that it's more of an opt in thing. You opt into being political as an artist. But the fundamental state of being an artist is to be outside of politics. Mm -hmm. But, but you know, I think with a lot of these things too, a lot of these polls, it's really just a matter of how you view the world. And right. actually, you can kind of agree on the same things. And it's just what language you use around it and, and what, what right. frame you put right. it in. Well, and the, the, my art doesn't necessarily uh, isn't isn't really you know putting all that in your face. That's mm -hmm. why, but even though I consider it political, perhaps I consider it political because I am a feminist and that plays into my work. But, but at the same time, I, I completely get when somebody says, I just sit out, I sit out uh, in the landscape and in uh, outdoors and I paint what I'm looking at. How can that be political? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I get what you're saying. I'm not going to force you to think you're, you've got to have politics in there, you know? Yeah. 
And the thing is, it's fine if you think this way. It's fine if you don't think this way. Right, right. It's and nice when, that and we all have different politics, views. Politics, that's a big umbrella of subjects as well. So, so yeah. But I mean, I think we're very, um, obviously, the world's, uh, I don't want to be negative, but the world's a mess. And so we're all very stressed out. We've all, you know, we've all been through um, two and a half really hard years. And so we're all kind of feeling the stress. So people are, I think people are very uh, more quick to be. I mean, I, at least I find that in, in real life and online that people, and I, so I, I think about that when somebody says something harsh, Mm. Um, I figure, well, you probably have just had a really rough time. Yeah, I, I'm not, you know, if somebody's really nasty, that's different. But I mean, some people just word things kind of harsh. And you think, whoa. But then you realize, well, it's this world right now that we're in and uh, everything that's happening. So. Yeah, I mean, I remember shortly before the pandemic, you were talking about uh, an exhibition you wanted to put on and you, you were inviting me to take part. And everything, the world seems so, so much better than I'm just gonna, Yeah, things are just going to, right? And it, it, and it was just right after that big announcement. And it was like, what? Yeah, just, yeah, the world changed so suddenly, right? Yeah. I mean, how, how are things where you are now in terms of opening up again? Because it's here, it's pretty much back to normal, except a lot of us are still extremely cautious yeah so we're like that too i mean we're at that situation where no restrictions there's the, you can wear a mask or not wear a mask it's up to the individual now mm. um all venues are open uh, performances concerts that kind of thing restaurants all that is pretty much back to the way it was two and a half years ago or whatever mm. so how's, it, how's this affecting your plans in terms of art and i suppose you're giving lessons but also gallery work you know the hard part of this for for us for the school is um we have to plan our classes months ahead and register so we're going to start registering for next fall and winter not knowing if the pandemic will come back full force or not so you know it's it makes things hard because yes right now we're we don't have any restrictions but i could register thinking it's like today finding out next november that i have to go online so, you know, I'm just trying to, we're just a small business, like all small businesses, we're going with the flow the best we can. I would like everyone to keep a mask on. I still wear a mask yeah. when I'm in a group. So, yeah, yeah, I'm always, I always have a mask with me. And, I don't know. well, let's, let's not get political again. But yeah, I, I think they're a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I'm like, I haven't gone to any art shows because there haven't been that many. So that'll start. To, I'm in a small city, though. We don't have a lot of art shows compared to, say, New York, or, you know, you can go to 30 shows a week in New York. You can go to one or two here, a few, but small. I think, what are we, 900,000? Something like that. My city. Is that big compared to you? I live in a village and it's 1,000. So <laughs> we don't get we don't get a lot of art shows. <laughs> what about the closest city? Well, uh, the closest town or well, big, big town has a population of about 70,000. And uh, but we're only 50 miles from Birmingham, which is over a million. So, oh, that's nice, yeah. yeah. Oh. So uh, well, as, as well as the as well as the Twitter polls we've been doing, we asked a question about a month ago on Twitter about marketing, uh, how to market poetry. Because let's face it, poetry is not as popular as it could be. 
it's not as popular as it was 200 years ago. So you had some interesting thoughts on this, especially comparing it to the visual art world. Right. How, how do you go about marketing art in general? And, uh, and how to all, actually, there's another specific question, because when we asked this, a couple of people got extremely angry about this question because they said that, you know, how can you as a left wing small press talk about marketing to people and trying to convince people to buy your products? And I found that baffling because, of course, if we don't do that, we can't exist. Yeah. But, but there's a lot of a lot of poets and perhaps you tell me, perhaps also visual artists have that feeling that we're meant to be against capitalism. So how can we then try to make people buy things from us? Well, you know, the bottom line is it would be fantastic if artists, and let's let's use the word artists to include poets and writers. It would be great if artists all made a living wage with their work, but very few of us do. And hence why uh, I chose to teach, uh, because I knew there were, there were ways that I could go about marketing my work and uh, be a full-time artist and not be an instructor that would involve grants, like filling out lots of grant forms and participating in that route, which is dicey because you become dependent on those grants. And yeah. Um, it's great in Canada. We do have a very good, we have the Canada Council, Manitoba Council. Uh, we do have grants available for artists, um, but everyone's competing for those grants. So you may or may not get them and you have to start like everything, like every job in the world. The first grants you get will be quite small. And then you apply for the next grant. It might be a little larger. And as your career grows, so sizably, may your grants grow as well. But I had this feeling, and this is just my own personal point of view, and it's not necessarily true of the grant system, but I didn't want to have to design my art to appeal to a board. Yeah. And alter things because you eventually you do have to know how, how to get a grant, right? There's ways of, you know, you have to, to be doing the work that is appreciated at the time as well. So I opted to do uh, the teaching because I one loved it and had already started teaching and, and then being able to be more selective about how I marketed my art because I could pay my my rent with my income from teaching so I wasn't going to starve and then figure out ways of marketing so and I did use different methods you wouldn't I, I did some insane things when I was young I uh, I literally not only would walk into art galleries unbeknownst to them with my work but I would phone and write people constantly. I mean, I had no pride. <laughs> I just, I, I, I had, a, I was young and ambitious and I believed in my work. So I would phone uh, uh, kind of famous artists and, and, and ask them for, to give me advice. And believe it or not, they did. So I remember uh, all, cold call all kinds of people, even um, Mary Boone Gallery, which at the time that I called Mary Boone, I don't, you probably don't know who she is because she was a New York gallerist. And she, she, I wanted her to look at my work and she was like, she's, she's famous. But I called her gallery and I, but the receptionist and I played dumb. I said, can I, talk, can I talk to Mary Boone? And they said, who are you? And I said, um, I'm Laura Kerr. I'm an artist on the prairies and I make experimental art. 
And at that time, I think I probably said processor. And the person said, uh-huh. And why do you think Mary Boone is going to talk to you? And he laughed. <laughs> and I said, because she's never shown the work of a prairie artist. Somebody, you know, I live in Winnipeg, Manitoba, in the middle of Canada, in the bald prairies. Doesn't, don't you think she'd think that was pretty cool? <laughs> and if not, why not? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because, you know, when I think back, I mean, I had all this audacity. But anyway, uh, the person just kept laughing and, you know, having a good time with me. And I never got to talk to her. But uh, yeah, things like that. I would write and, and walk into galleries. And that's what I did at first to try and get my work seen. But um, that's not probably marketing because you're not necessarily making money doing something like that you're just getting but it helped i mean it helped me um make some connections by doing stuff like that so um marketing though well like you use social media to market your your work that would be would you say that is your primary way of marketing well definitely yeah yeah see i think that is at one point i would not have put a lot of faith in social media marketing but now i i think it's changed where i definitely have made a lot more connect i mean i met you um and a lot of other people to do with publishing and poetry so i think it's like a great connect I still think though that it's like for, for, for yourself per se, um, marketing would also possibly be, and I've talked to you about this before, I would love you to teach how to write anagrams. Like that would be. Yeah, uh, it's, not, it's on my list of things to eventually get around to. Yeah, because I, I, I think that would also be an excellent way of marketing. Mm. Um, what you do and and what it is what anagrams are i mean people would do little mini courses maybe and that kind of thing marketing has been um we've never had a lot of money to advertise so um we used to take out little advertising um of our school classes in neighborhood newspapers and that kind of thing but I don't even know if that actually was, how do you, I don't even, Jeff and I have often talked about, we don't, we used to put our ads in papers and did, do we even know if we ever got a student because of those ads? Probably not. So, but I mean, advertising is a hit and miss. So we, we, we haven't done that. For us, it was mostly word of mouth as far and and i think social media is vastly word of mouth because definitely i have met so many people on twitter through other people and so i have connected made friends we have bought each other's books um would that be enough for a career for myself if, to pay no no um that that you know like i think you have to it's the word i th i think you have to always have something else oh and, definitely yeah this i mean yeah. this is something we, we think about a lot that we are very reliant on twitter right so what if twitter disappears tomorrow where right. does that leave us right yeah exactly what happens if uh, who knows alan musk decides he doesn't like twitter and he just and he doesn't really miss the three million or 22 billion or whatever it was that he 22 billion i don't know what he paid anyway whatever he paid for it is pocket money to him yeah so he just goes bye well, you know so, what? about about half the sales we get are to people who aren't on twitter i mean obviously i'm, I'm guessing there but we see the names of the people who, who are buying things and so where are they finding 
your books? Like if they're not people from Twitter. Mm, I'm thinking, well, they know people who are on Twitter or it's just, it's a complete word of mouth thing that, that they know somebody on Twitter by about five degrees of, of separation. Yeah. yeah. See now, like I have bought books from your press and I have put them in my library in my school and my students have looked at them so I'm thinking you know and I have talked up your press one of the things I would suggest too is that a lot of young people here I don't know about the rest of the world I can only kind of gauge it from my community a lot of the younger um, artists and I'm talking say uh, 20 to, to 35 30 they don't have twitter they all have instagram and i can see the importance of instagram for selling for marketing even though it's not the same if you don't get the social aspect the talking the sharing ideas you're pretty much just a lone person really and yeah. then you hashtag different things well that's what but, i didn't like about it I, I tried instagram and i didn't like the fact there's no retweet option no no but i think younger people i'm talking you know like my daughter's age they love it they they know what they're looking for and they look through hashtags and they they do a lot of shopping uh through uh instagram I don't know. I think it's a neat idea that it could be a, a, a new way of, of marketing and buying and sharing product. Not sure, you know, like I wouldn't necessarily, I think people used to put artwork there, like digital art pieces, maybe, or poetry, like a loopy car. Well, yeah, but, yes, I mean, she's yeah. the famous success right. story of Instagram. Right. Yeah. Yes, but I'm not so sure that that um, that's doesn't happen very often. Success like that, mm. but, yeah. So, well, let, let's uh, let's talk about you because we've, we've talked generally here about arts. We haven't talked much about your your art, okay, and your process, which is I mean, surely it's an extremely varied process since you're working with so many different types of media. Yes, I know lots and i i switch things up and i i work at a feverish pace <laughs> but i was going to show you just so you can see that i make uh encaustic piece boards i don't know if you can can you see that i can it's it's great uh, we'll have to uh find a way to show uh, this image to people listening oh i thought maybe when the podcast came out i could just put some of these up and yeah. anyway this is these i have thousands i've made literally thousands of these over the years could you describe and, it for people pardon me could you How describe, would I describe it? it okay well um the theme is based on the fisherman and his wife which is a grim's fairy tale and most of them have to do with that because as a child and as an adult, it's my favorite fairy tale. And they involve fish, which all of them have fish images and different textures to do with plants that you find in the ocean and that kind of thing. It's oil paint, markers, um, melted stuff, and encaustic paint. That's what I photograph. And that's what most of my digital art starts as. So my digit, so this sometimes your, your they, digital art is not digital art. It's <laughs> so so it starts out something that I've made by hand most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time. Sometimes it will be just a texture. I'll show you one. Um, this is great because I think a lot of people would not guess this. No, that's why I'm. That's the mystery, right? So here's one with a lot of texture. Mm. Oh, that so I might zoom in and take just a tiny little close up of a part of my work. And then in this case, it became a digital art piece. So I'll show you that digital art piece was once 
one of those boards. Now that one, this one looks very much like the boards. It's very unchanged, but sometimes I can take a pattern like that, which are W's and increase the size. And that becomes my, my secret digital art. So it's because, and not very many people on Twitter probably know this, I consider myself a process artist. So I make at a constant pace little things. Mm. And then I use those little things. I photograph them and I digitize them with every possible, whatever's been invented. The only thing I don't do in my work is code. I don't do any coding, but um, that's a whole nother ball game. Yeah. And then I, uh, I have um, uh, Illustrator, Photoshop, Mm, all different types of pixelation or uh, generative programs that I can put it through. You know, they change so much. It's just that I like to start with an actual um, handmade object and then go into my digital. This is great. I mean, this is, it, it's so similar to a lot of things I see text-based poets I know doing, especially in the, the area of constraints, you, you take something that already exists, you yes. manipulate it by applying different processes, yeah. different uh, literary restrictions, for example, but not just that, uh, you could right. do all sorts of things. So it's, I mean, and the thing is, you've got this now and you can keep going forward. As new technologies emerge, you can apply exactly. those and it keeps yes. going and going. Yes, and, and the thing is like, every once in a while I say to myself, I, I must sit down now, and physically hand make more encaustic art pieces boards um, because I'm I feel like I'm running out and then I discover one I haven't used in a while so like, I've got this and I never throw anything out so on my phone I have hold on I have a major major phone here but on my phone alone photograph wise because I use my phone by the way, as the camera, which I don't know, that just let me out of all the photographers are going to unfollow me now. <laughs> I just confessed my only camera. Well, a lot of people do now. Right? Okay, so right now, as we stand, I have 31,983 photographs of my art. That's a lot. And so I can't possibly, and, and most of it, I haven't even, I forgot that even me, it goes back, you know, old stuff that I have on my phone. So I'll, I'm always, but lately I've been thinking I have to hit the studio. It's about time that I started hand making some pieces and then I'm putting some new energy into my, my digital work. Why I do it, you know, that whole thing with visual poetry um, was a new, exciting kind of avenue for me as a visual artist um, using sort of made up language that uh, the computer will often do strange things which is the generative part that I'm even surprised and it resembles uh, letters but they're not you know or pieces of broken letters and things like that and words so I just I just got kind of this whole wow well, this will be interesting to explore uh, you know and and my digital art will have a purpose that I can use it but I you know it's all it's all new I, I'm not I'm, I'm still learning and I know I don't put enough language in my work but I will I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a novice when it comes to poetry so we all are we all are we're always yeah. still learning you know well, yeah i mean it's you know i always think and i tell artists young artists this that i talk with you know you should always remain a student mm. your yeah, whole definitely. Life. yeah because that's you know basically how you keep going yeah yeah on that note what comes next we've really talked about nfts and that's obviously going to be something that's it's going to change the way people make art. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what else is there, do you think? What else is on the horizon that will change the way that everybody's making art, but also the way that you are making art? Things go in cycles. And when, you, when you've been through a few cycles, you realize that there's, it's gonna be another cycle. Um, some, I remember when the computer was web two. So what's that? 90s, 1990s, Web 2. Um, I, I just mean, I, like I've, I have had the computer as part of my work, okay, since the 80s, believe it or not, I had the first Apple computer. It was black and white images only. I think that because of all our time online, this is my prediction, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens. We have been spending the last two and a half years glued to our platforms, our social media, uh, to be connected with people while social distancing and sometimes actually having to isolate. And I feel like the next, and, and of course the, the natural transition during all this were NFT platforms, crypto art. I feel like it might turn, be a turn of the tide there and go back to um, holding and holding a book and- well, I um, hope so, I hope so. Bookstores and independent bookstores and, and small niche kind of uh, cozy places to sit and, and purchase and read and that kind of thing libraries might become somewhat of a big thing again and lots of small spaced gallery shows i think because we're going to want people contact in a lot of of what we do uh, create in a creative way that it's going to involve being together in real in real life as opposed to necessarily online which brings me to when you mentioned getting uh, something together you wanted to bring people to uh, Wales, I guess, to uh, meet up. Yeah. And everybody got, did you notice how excited everybody got? I did, yeah. And it's uh, it's completely understandable, isn't it? That, right. With what we've right. all been through, yeah. Yes. And so um, I, I think that we're going to, I think it will be equally experimental, but we will be, a little less virtual. Yeah, uh, you know, people are tired of the Zoom chats and the and all the rest that goes with it. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm I'm not tired of this Zoom chat. Although no. I, I, well, we can tell no. the listeners we've we've had a few technical dif difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> it was just me. <laughs> it's just me. And you know, here's the thing: I am on the computer twenty four seven. And my husband will say, "Did you get the email that so and so sent you?" And I'll say, oh, okay. And I'll look and I say, I don't have it. And he says, well, you have to have it. And it's like, oh, I think I've deleted it by mistake. Because when you're involved with computers and you're a digital artist, you are the worst at the simple task, like managing your email. And it's like a nightmare. So, I mean, it's funny. You know, there's just, you would think that if anybody could just get in there and pull out the, the email, it would be someone who's always online and always doing digital art. No, so, but yeah, but that anyway, that's my prediction and we'll see what happens because I don't think online and virtual reality and augmented reality is going to disappear. It's going to even get more slick, more um, as they bringing it into your living room and that kind of thing. I'm just saying that there's also going to be a need for picking up a book, owning a book, owning uh, a piece of art again. Yeah. Well, Laura, thank you so much for spending this time. And okay. I, I'm really, I really enjoy hearing you speak about art and the enthusiasm oh, you. you have and the innovation that you're showing. So Great. thank you. Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs>